Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we will have t this morning a panel on historical tra 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 trajectories of populism in East Central Europe, and it's quite a dense program. For that reason, I will be brief with the introduction uh, of our panelists. Uh, you all know Jan Kubik, who is the director of the School of Slavonic and East European Studies of the University College London. Uh, before coming to London, he taught at Rutgers University. Uh, he, I, I know him as an historian of civil society in Poland, or we all know him, uh, for his book, The Power of Symbols Against the Symbols of Power, The Rise of Solidarity and the Fall of State Socialism in Poland and Rebellious Civil Society. Um, Beyond that, he has uh, written contributions to the history of science in East Central Europe, uh, for example, about the relationship between political science and cultural anthropology. And uh, he is uh, renowned for his book about the politics of memory, uh, 20 years after communism, the politics of memory and commemoration. We had together a conference on reconciliation in the framework of the uh, uh, German-Ukrainian Historical Commission, and, and your book was one of uh, the main bases of, this, of our discussions there. Um, the second panelist is Marta Kotwas. She is postgraduate student at UCL. She holds a philosophy MA from the University of Łódź. And her current research is about the social cultural interpretations and the, of the right wing populism in East Central Europe and of modern Polish Catholicism. So I'm looking forward to your presentations. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for having us here. It's a great privilege and honor to be. Uh, at this conference. Uh, this is a project in the making, so this, a lot of material here is sort of provisional and some of the ideas are still under development, so please um, uh, give us your feedback, your criticism. Uh, I will go through the theoretical part as fast as I can uh, to get to uh, the bunch of examples to, to, so you can see uh, our uh, method and our approach. <clears throat> in the article that is quite influential in, in the work on, on populism, right-wing populism, uh, Norris and Inglehart uh, look at three types of explanations. Um, they focus on the demand side of public opinion in particular as the dominant uh, explanation in their work. It is uh, obvious because they of course, use the data of the World Value Survey, and Engelhard used to be the chief investigator, as, as you know. Um, so I will not talk about those other explanations. Um, let's um, sort of stay with them for a moment. We're looking at the demand side of public opinion. Uh, they test two uh, theses. One is that um, this phenomenon is driven by economic concerns, for example, the rising inequality, on the other hand, they, they look at other set of variables, the World Value Survey, to uh, test a competing theory, which they call the cultural backlash thesis. They eventually conclude that there is more um, into the, to, to the cultural backlash thesis, so it is rather a culturally driven phenomenon than the phenomenon driven by economic concerns, however we, would, um, we will understand them. <clears throat> So what we uh, try to add to this is to take seriously the distinction between uh, supply and demand side of politics, and we look at the rise of right-wing populism as a form of what we call delayed and constructed cultural backlash. And the cultural dimension of populism's uh, rise tend to be studied from the demand side. We are looking, we are going to the um, supply side. And we are looking at the specific kind of evidence. I will mention it in a moment. In a way, our work is similar to the work that was already uh, examined here and presented in, in uh, Krzyzanowski's uh, lecture keynote in the morning. 
Um, so then he and Vodak look at discourses, the written language. We are looking uh, at the visual evidence and rituals. Uh, so just to give you a bit of the taste of what we are promising in the title, and the, the, we are not going to go over all the words in the title in our presentation. There's no time, although we have some, some stuff already prepared on that in, in the way we're the, the way reviewing the material. So we just observe that there are two methods of studying the cultural demand thesis. Let's stay on the demand side for a moment. Um, the same thing is actually true for those who study the uh, economic demand thesis, if we can call it this way. So there are surveys and there are community studies. A very classical, very important distinction. Surveys, of course, treat people aggregatively, that you have sets of individuals, you, you sample and you obtain some kind of information. Communities are a much more holistic method. You use case studies. So the surveys, of course, Inglehart Norris, and I just recently heard um, Diane Muntz, uh, she is the political scientist from the University of Pennsylvania, presented an extremely interesting um, results of her study of Trump's electorate. No time to go through this, just two thoughts from, from uh, Diane Muntz's uh, paper. Uh, Trump's support was not driven by personal economic hardship or by prospective personal economic concerns. It was driven by the sense of threat. Threat is the key word in, in her study, either to the domestic social status of uh, individuals uh, in group. For example, men feel threatened by women, white men, or white people in general threatened by the Hispanics in particular, but the colored people in more general sense. But what she finds particularly interesting in her study that Americans are increasingly feel threatened by the, the world outside of the United States. And that was statistically significant, and she said, quite actually stunning. So the country as a whole feels threatened. Um, but anyway, the concept of the threat is important. <clears throat> On the side of community studies, you have two very influential books uh, about the United States, somewhat perhaps some, some of it may be known to you, perhaps the second one, particularly Hillbilly Elegy, uh, uh, he goes back to uh, Appalachia, which I actually know a little bit about, and, and studies his village. You know, it's, it's kind of an ethnographic study of how to understand this growing despair, dis disillusionment, and how it turns into this kind of desire to find a savior or redemptor, as, as we will call it in, in our work. <clears throat> Uh, on just two examples from Poland, um, which is our main uh, uh, topic uh, in terms of uh, empirical evidence. Uh, Tomasz Rakowski, a fantastic book, to, um, which came, just came out, um, an anthropologist, Hunters, Gatherers, and Practitioners of Powerlessness. Uh, he looks at three locations in Poland, and um, unfortunately only in Polish, uh, Piotr Binder, the, the young people and poverty, in which he co co compares uh, the communities in uh, post-collective farm environments in Russia and in Poland. The key point we take from those two books is that they write about the evidence is sort of from the 90s, and there's no sign of the interest in right-wing populism. So, on the mental map, cultural map, political map of those people, the, this kind of solution doesn't exist yet. The, they are sometimes in incredibly tight situations, sometimes tragic situations. So the demand, in a way, is there, but uh, it doesn't translate yet into what we see later. Hence, we think there's something about this delay. So we look at the supply side of populism, we look, we look at visual performance, rituals, and so on. The main points, if I never get to anything else, please remember our main points. We think the important part of the literature is the literature on the varieties of populism, particularly the distinction between uh, thin and thick. And then we, uh, the this very important concept for us is polarization. So we started tracing down polarization in various phenomena, and it's of course a key definitional features of, feature of populism. We are looking at uh, the symbolism of polarization, and we are looking at the phenomenon of hegemony. If you go back to Gramsci, and you know, there's one, one of my favorite concepts, and hegemony, as I will present very quickly for a moment, is the phenomenon in which polarization against the key uh, feature. So 
We're looking at symbolic polarization in thin and thick populist symbolism. We will try to trace it a little bit across time, and then we will um, link, if we have time, the phenomenon of redemption to um, polarization. <clears throat> so varieties of populism, ideational approach. We talked about it quite a bit yesterday. This is then the, the, the populism is not the feature of uh, political parties per se. Alan discussed this very well and very clearly yesterday, and we, we all talked about it. It is a feature of discourse ideology, however you would call it. Kaz Mude, who is also um, um, an important person uh, for us, um, and I, you know, he's a very good friend. We talked about it many times. The, 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 he insists increasingly that this is a, a feature of ideology, rather. So he, he, in the most recent book, they called it um, ideational approach. So. What are the features, though, of the phenomenon? Right? We talked about it yesterday. Let me go over it one more time. We, we try to narrow down the, the understanding of populism, and we take those four features um, that constitute together thin populism very seriously. So binarism, people versus elites. Two, antagonism between those two sets. Three, popular idea of sovereignty, volonté générale in one way or another, which leads to the idea that the substance of democracy trumps, trumps uh, procedures. And then the Manichaean outlook. It all becomes extremely serious. This is uh, believed to be essential, a feature of reality, which is often then being seen as the struggle of the forces of good and evil. If you add to those uh, features of thin populism, and nativism, for example, or personalistic authoritarianism. Again, yesterday we heard about it quite a bit. Um, and or religion, which we didn't talk much about. Then you are kind of thickening thin populism. So in a way, we are interested in the process of thickening uh, thin populism. I will skip that slide because I'm beginning to see that I'm uh, a little bit off target already on time. But the, I tr we try to already order a little bit in the information about Central European populisms. They are thin, they are thick. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a populism of Babish and, and, and Anno in the Czech Republic is kind of what I called urbane populism. On the other hand, you have Kotleba or you have uh, Fides, of course, we talked all about it. And then the final thing I want to tell you from this slide is at the bottom, Kaczynski to me uh, has some, something for us. Uh, we call it messianic religious populism. Kaczynski, in addition to the quotes that you heard already yesterday, from time to time says that he really wants to defend Europe against itself and make sure that Europe gets back to its proper self, which is uh, Catholic, nationalistic, religious, and these forgotten uh, ideals that are rotting in the West will be swept away and will come back to the, the beautiful true nature of, of what Europe is. Based on Papas and Creasy, very interesting book about the rise of populism, about the crisis of 2008, um, we tabulated the data that is there and checked the data against electoral results uh, from um, elsewhere. And so you see it, in those four countries, uh, quite a difference, right? This consistent presence of populism in Slovakia, thin and thick. There is much less of it, of course, in the bottom line is the Czech Republic, although after 2006 it goes up. And then you have green, uh, uh, of course, we know Hungary has kind of <clears throat> surpassed everybody else, else and, and is kind of ahead. Although, you know, the red line Polish populism also keeps going up. Um, Fidesz, of course, in the last elections got a little bit less than in elections um, before. Um, so this is Babish, kind of, you know, Putin takes pictures with tigers. This is a small tiger, but nonetheless a tiger or something like that. Um, this is Kotleba. I don't need to uh, comment on his uh, uniform. Um, this is uh, Polish right-wing uh, youth uh, stop Islamization, fa the family, motherland, uh, and so on, and the cross, of course. And then you have one of the most iconic pictures, the Jobbik uh, demonstration in Budapest. Um, symbolic polarization and hegemony. Um, so what we need to do here is to think through the phenomenon of polarization and then link it a little bit with hegemony. I will concentrate on 
only one line here. So the, the review of some classical writings about polarization shows it, it's, it, it is you know an interesting book to be written um, 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 just on that. Pay attention, uh, please, to just the last one. Uh, Yuri Lotman, uh, the famous uh, uh, semiotician, uh, look, his last book called Culture and Explosion in English, uh, Kultura is Rif in, in, in Russian, um, uh, this divides cultures into binary and ternary. We do not agree that you know, Russia is all binary and the West is all ternary, but the, the distinction of two types of cultures may be valid and useful. In binary cultures, you have trend toward constant polarization, therefore any move forward comes in the form of kind of, as he calls it, explosion. It's difficult to deal with at least. Whereas in ternary cultures, you have cultural and institutional devices allowing people to meet in the middle and therefore find resolution, find some kind of compromise. And for us, this is a very, very important part of the argument. Um, just, just keep this thought in, in mind. Again, what we will say is that the populists polarize. Um, hegemony, um, very quickly, you know, I have to rush a little bit. Uh, this is uh, David Leighton, the influential, very influential political scientist who once was interested in culture very seriously, not anymore, unfortunately. And taking Gramsci, he says, in any culture, a poli a members of political elite, cultural political entrepreneurs can take a strand of culture turn it through a very systematic work into the dominant division in the society, and then they have to convince people that this division, this bipolar vision, constitutes the main cleavage, symbolic cleavage in the society, which then slowly, hopefully, from the point of the elite that tries to manipulate people this way, people, everybody will start thinking about all kinds of issues and problems in terms of this dominant uh, symbolic cleavage. That's basically the essence of what, how hegemony, according to Latin, works. And I, I used this idea in my uh, earlier works, and, and I, I think that it kind of works. <clears throat> Once the hegemonic divide is defined in terms of good versus evil, then the politician can easily assume the role of redemptor. And then we looked at the definition in English Oxford Dictionary, and we said, bingo. You know, you look at the very simple definition. Redemption is the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, and evil. Sin, error, and evil are, this is the standard repertoire of the populist language. Right? So that, that's, that's the kind of a nice coincidence. Very quickly, Polish solidarity. Uh, Polish po this is what I've earlier worked on. Uh, I argued in my first book that Martin kindly mentioned that solidarity success was possible due to symbolic overheating and very powerful symbolic polarization. We, the people, good people versus the bad authorities, right? Well, if that was the case, then obviously, according to the definition that we provided earlier, solidarity was thin populism. Yes, solidarity was thin populism. It was the populist movement in terms of thin kind of understanding of this ideology. And this is where, which, this is the moment from which we will try to start showing how this thin populism gets thickened. So we are looking at um, the role of populist polarization um, in various political regimes. Uh, we thought that it is important to um, analyze what is the role of populist polarization both in democratic and non-democratic regimes, but also in the context of a revolution. So if we look at the simple graph you might be familiar with that was um, published in recently uh, in, in one of the papers by Kas Muder, um, so, um, just very briefly, not to go into much detail, um, this graph shows um, the political regimes listed from uh, the most uh, authoritarian on the left to the most democratic on the right. Um, so, um, it shows the impact on populism uh, in case of transition processes. Um, so, what Muda is not considering in this uh, analysis 
is whether there are any differences between the role of thin populism and thick populism on those stages. This is one of the things that, uh, that we also wonder about. So for example, uh, if we take um, the example in the, in the left, uh, top left-hand corner, um, a populist polarization uh, might have a positive impact on the process of liberalization, uh, which we argue was the case uh, with solidarity. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the bottom right-hand corner shows uh, the process of democratic erosion, which can be uh, also influenced by populism uh, because uh, it, populist polarization fosters uh, de-democratization de process in this case. And why is populism a problem uh, for democracy? Um, as um, very recent data uh, uh, gathered and, and compiled by um, Roberto Foa and Yasha Monk uh, on the basis of World Value Survey data shows, there is a global shift um, which indicates democratic deconsolidation. So, um, in, in one of the key questions that they looked at, um, so uh, whether citizens uh, wish for a strong leader uh, who doesn't have to bother with elections in, instead of a more uh, kind of democratic uh, system, there is a considerable uh, growing support in many, many countries around the world. Um, so people are more and more often wishing for a strong leader um, uh, to, to be ruling. Uh, in our empirical analysis, as Jan said, we are looking at um, visual data. Um, we are looking at um, symbolic polarization. Um, the analysis is built on pairs between um, uh, the symbolic uh, polarization used by the Solidarity Movement uh, and um, the way it is used uh, presently. So uh, we're thinking there is a certain shift from thin to thick populism. We have um, divided the symbols uh, into a few themes. We won't unfortunately have the time to go through all of them. We'll focus just on the first three uh, themes. So let's now move to the pictures. Um, the first uh, example um, of um, polarization um, that is present in the religious con context is the Poznań monument. It is a monument uh, erected in 1981 to commemorate uh, the workers uh, fallen during the strikes in June uh, 1956 in Poznań. Uh, these two images uh, present uh, the way that, um, well, on the left, uh, the monument looked in its original version, and on the right, after refurbishment in 2006. And one of the key elements of the refurbishment was changing the inscription on the monument. So originally it said, for freedom, law and bread, June 1956, the added part that appeared in 2006 is about or for God. So what we can see here is um, some sort of religious intensification. Um, so this is clear that this is uh, an added element which, um, uh, which might indicate some, some kind of um, thickening uh, of, uh, of the kind of symbolic uh, message. Uh, the second example uh, we looked at, the cross. Um, this picture uh, was taken in the Gdańsk shipyard in August 1980 during the strikes. The workers erected uh, a cross uh, in order to, um, well, first of all, claim that space for themselves, so they identified themselves as religious people, um, but also it was um, a way to uh, indicate an opposition to communist authorities. So this was um, a gesture that had this polarizing power, um, us versus the ruler, rulers. Now this um, picture, um, 
uh, was taken in uh, 1998, where suddenly the cross becomes a very powerful polarizing tool. Um, the crosses you can see in this image were erected by a um, group of um, extreme um, Catholics uh, led by Kazimierz Świtoń um, at the site of the former Nazi concentration and extermination camp in Auschwitz. Um, so, in this case, we see a very strong encroachment on the sacred ground of another religion. So, um, this uh, set of events uh, was really extremely divisive for the Polish society. Um, and the debate that emerged uh, afterwards um, was definitely um, um, very, very polarized. Uh, uh, in the end, um, it was uh, the Pope, John Paul II, that had to intervene in order to just cut it short and have the crosses removed. Uh, but here, definitely, the cross becomes a very powerful symbolic weapon. And this picture uh, was taken not that long ago. The cross in the middle of the image was um, erected uh, in front of the presidential palace in Warsaw after the Smolensk plane crash in 2010. So first uh, function of the symbol is to commemorate the victims um, who died. But then you can see other elements uh, which in our opinion indicate a thickening a process of thickening, of symbolic thickening. Well, first of all, uh, you can see one of the billboards saying, uh, wake up Poland and return to God. So the idea was that Poland uh, was in the wrong, was in the sin. It should, um, you know, find its true Christian Catholic self by returning to God. Uh, there is another large banner there at the side, which is even more divisive. It uses a very strongly charged language. Uh, it actually calls some media representatives or politicians the enemies of Poland, traitors, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, together with um, the intensification also of, of the presence of national symbols, you can see quite a lot of white and red flags and so on. Uh, this is a deeply polarizing, symbolic action that took place over there. Um, the last um, example uh, from the theme of religion, um, Jesus Christ. In the context of solidarity, Jesus is very often present on the cross. Um, so, uh, obviously, this is a symbol of redemption, of suffering, um, we may think that you know, it's the suffering of the people, and um, in general, uh, the context is quite humble. Well, there is a shift now. Um, you might be familiar with this one. This is um, the tallest statue of Jesus Christ in the world, uh, which was erected in Świebodzin, and this is a monument called um, Jesus Christ uh, the king of the universe. Um, so, um, it kind of symbolically shifts the redemptive power to be somehow in the hand of Poland, right? Um, and even further, uh, this image was uh, taken in the context of 2016 enthronement of Jesus Christ as the King of Poland. In case uh, you didn't know, Poland is now, has now got a king. Um, so uh, this movement was led by a few fringe Catholic uh, groups, but then it was um, given um, legitimation by uh, the Polish Episcopal Commission and also the authorities because uh, during the official celebrations uh, of the enthronement of Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see um, uh, who was present there. It's uh, President Andrzej Duda, uh, visible in the middle of the last image. 
Uh, now let's move to um, national symbols. So the white eagle, uh, that is um, the Polish emblem, um, together with the red uh, background, it, uh, the, the shield, it, it forms the Polish coat of arms. Um, this is how it uh, changed over the years in 20th century. So um, the first version is um, just after the First World War. You can see the eagle with a different type of crown. It's quite important here. Uh, it's a closed crown with a cross. Then in 27, um, there was a reform. So um, the version in top right-hand corner was proposed and adopted. After the war in 45, uh, the eagle lost its crown. Crown is significant because, of course, it's a symbol of sovereignty. So um, after 1989, um, uh, the authorities um, um, gave the eagle the crown back, um, but uh, you can see that they uh, decided to go for the open version of the crown. At the moment, um, there is quite an intense debate on the right uh, side of the Polish political scene. Um, quite a lot of uh, nationalist activists and um, uh, right-wing groups argue that this is basically wrong. Um, we should probably ideally go back to the version in the left uh, top corner, uh, or at least give uh, the eagle a closed crown, so there is the intensification of uh, the element of sovereignty that they, um, that they want. Um, so, um, Again, our, our kind of pet analysis and uh, under communism, uh, the eagle was very often given a crown, um, which was, again, a symbolic gesture to oppose the communist authorities and to uh, make a connection with the times when Poland was uh, sovereign before the, first, uh, before the Second World War. Um, here, um, in the present situation, this is actually a screenshot from a very popular online uh, store selling so-called patriotic clothing and gadgets. Red is bad, mind you. Um, so, um, they have uh, appropriated a Polish national emblem, and you can see that already in the gadgets, uh, there is the eagle with a closed crown used by them. So they are very, very efficient um, and use the symbols um, kind of freely and, and with, with a certain boldness. The other side of the political scene, the more kind of centrist or liberal, um, well, uh, there is a certain ineptness in, in terms of using political, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in, in using symbols. So this, this picture was taken in 2013. Uh, when uh, President Komorowski uh, led the um, celebrations of the Independence Day, the 11th of uh, November. Uh, they tried to transform this uh, holiday into something kind of cheerful, family-friendly and so on. Uh, one of um, uh, the things that happened was uh, the, there was this huge um, uh, eagle made of chocolate produced, uh, symbolically I'm afraid it was a complete failure. The, the eagle um, has no crown. It was mocked mercilessly online. As, as the caption says, it looked uh, as if it was floundering in shit. Independence Day. So the Polish national holiday of the 11th of November, um, uh, the celebrations of the, of the 11th, 11th of November, when forbidden under communism. Um, the picture from 1979 shows a group of opposition activists um, who gathered spontaneously and led this small uh, march in the streets of Warsaw uh, that in the end attracted around 5,000 people, many of whom were subsequently arrested and imprisoned for a few months um, for breaking the law. At the moment, the Polish national holiday has been kind of taken over. Um, each year, 
probably mostly since uh, 2011, uh, there are massive marches attended mostly by right-wing activists, by football fans, um, by various uh, fringe groups that, um, as you can see, uh, very intensely employ symbols, um, uh, the flag that they are carrying uh, says the defenders of po Polishness. There is um, a very uh, kind of strong symbolic message here and also uh, the number of symbols used is, is enormous. Uh, you can't really see that very clearly probably in this picture but there is um, a flag with the um, 1918 uh, eagle somewhere, there is a Hungarian flag, uh, there are caps with the logo of uh, the Warsaw Uprising, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a case of really extreme symbolic intensification. And what they also do is uh, they uh, discursively uh, are, are very divisive. So this is a very strong language, uh, apart from the uh, you know, obvious uh, uh, visual layer, uh, it, it also... Um, well, it actually says Poland for Poles, Poles for Poland, so, uh, you know, this is a, a very a strongly charged uh, message. Um, now, the significance of Europe, uh, just very briefly, this picture was taken by Jan at the um, Museum of Solidarity uh, in Gdańsk, um, which... Um, uh, yes, there is, there is a small poster on the door saying Europe starts here. The whole um, message uh, of the uh, Museum of Solidarity is the message of openness. They want to create an agora that will uh, be open to other European nations for dialogue and communication. So um, the, the Museum of Solidarity, uh, the, the European Centre of Solidarity, presents uh, itself as an entrance to Europe. Uh, Right-wing groups, this is again a poster um, advertising the independence march. Um, well, they, they present Poland as, uh, uh, um, well, uh, uh, a fortress, thank you. Uh, a fortress that is supposed to defend Europe. So, um, well, you of course have the cross, uh, uh, the symbol of Christian Europe that can be only defended by Poles. Uh, you have, you know, the soldier on the horse, uh, plus uh, Polish national colors, colors white and red, and this whole kind of powerful, uh, almost military symbolism present here. And the last, just very shortly, set of examples. Um, uh, this is something um, which we think is, is kind of uh, quite interesting because it's recent uh, and uh, and probably worth um, looking at uh, in terms of, of the, the most recent uh, political events. So, um, of course, these uh, uh, symbols and these topics were not really salient during the times of solidarity, but they have gained um, an enormous significance uh, presently. So... Um, this is the Square of Saviour in Warsaw, or maybe was, uh, because the, the rainbow is no longer there. So the rainbow was an artwork by Julita Wojcik, uh, which was placed there in 2012. Um, and it uh, obviously very quickly gained um, significance for LGBT movements. It is also a very trendy part of Warsaw, very popular with young people, so it was um, by those uh, groups adopted very cheerfully and uh, quickly became a symbol. But for um, Catholics, it was a very divisive symbol because of the presence of the um, uh, Church of, of the Savior. Um, but for right-wing activists, it was also a symbol of the sin. The rainbow was vandalized uh, numerous times. It was set on fire quite a few times, uh, remarkably uh, also during the celebrations of Polish Independence Day. Uh, so you can see that um, symbolically it's very obvious. We are defending Poland 
um, uh, the true Polishness fights the sin of um, homosexuality or what have you. And maybe this is a more optimistic um, example um, of actually the more liberal um, uh, side that is obviously uh, setting itself in opposition to uh, the right-wing discourse um, has managed to create a few powerful symbols um, uh, last year. So this, uh, this is a, a picture taken during the black protest or black marches uh, in October 2016, uh, which erupted as a result of um, the attempt to introduce a complete ban on abortion in Poland last year. Um, uh, well, the result was, uh, first of all, a, a, a strike of Polish women, uh, which was uh, somehow joined or supported by around six million people in Poland. Uh, so mass marches in Warsaw and in, in many cities and, and towns across the countries. You can see that one of the uh, key symbols used here is the color black, the color of mourning. Uh, the other powerful symbol, um, really quite uh, kind of um, violent, I would say, is the symbol of hanger, uh, which is the symbol of illegal uh, kind of uh, abortions that, uh, that women would be forced to um, carry out themselves if um, there is no legal option for doing it uh, in Poland anymore. Okay, thank you. And we're almost on time. So conclusions, uh, very quickly. So the, the task was to observe a change in the symbolic sphere, culture, to, to see, um, determine the contribution of this symbolic change to the rise of thick populism. So we're observing the, the change um, in meaning. We, we believe, uh, this, you saw a few examples, that we demonstrated the change in meaning of several symbols intensely used by the populists, both thin and thick. Now, the, the, the next paragraph, for those of you who are a little bit into semiotics, may be very clean, but may, uh, clear, but I may need to unpack it a bit for the others. But uh, what we're saying is that the practices that thicken the symbolic repertoire of, of populists, as the populist goes from thin to thick, expand connotation, which is the number of uh, symbolic attributes, but as you expand connotation, you shrink or reduce the notation, i.e. the number of objects covered by such symbol or symbolic system, which means that the fewer people are able to recognize themselves in those symbols, right? You, you add, keep adding attributes, you, you have more uh, elements in the symbolic system, fewer people will be able to identify with this. If, if you have fewer um, and somewhat vaguer symbolic system, then more people can um, identify themselves. And we think this is the major move, we hope we, we kind of uh, demonstrated some of it, um, which, which means that the number of people who identify with those thickened symbols of Polishness is shrinking. In solidarity, it was 10 million people, the biggest movement in history, I still argue. If someone finds, you know, every third poll was in solidarity at some point. There was no other movement like that in the history of the study of social movements. I've been studying them for 40 years. So now, this number of people who see themselves in those symbols is smaller. So extreme populist right, for example, through those marches and rallies that Marta portrayed a little bit, are symbolically very rich. They use many symbols, but, and they signify national identity, thick national identity that resonates that increasingly narrow, narrower set of people. And hence, there's a paradox that populism in the thin version is we, the good people, versus the bad authorities. Whereas the populism in the thick version begins to divide the people themselves. Those mythical people we talked about yesterday of the populist rhetoric, they are shrinking in, in reality because they are uh, identified by these kind of thickening, increasingly rich uh, symbolic system. So the nationalistic and religious thickening of symbolism contributes to the change from thin to thick. 
during the first solidarity, thin populism and its attending symbolism served to sharply delineate the good people and the bad authorities. The symbolism of thick populism is simultaneously intensely moral, sin, error, evil, and narrowly nationalistic, very interesting combination in a way. As such, it serves to sharply divide the people into good and bad categories, also good and bad co-nationals. Jaruzelski. Er, uh, Kaczynski <laughs> makes it very clear that you know, so there are good Poles and bad Poles. Uh, those words you saw yesterday about uh, Poles of worst sort, right? If someone doesn't find themselves in those symbols, Peace uses, Peace is not exactly the right-wing organization of the, like those that organize those events, but Peace never ever prevented them from demonstrating and marching through the streets. Just the opposite. It is pretty clear that the police now has, is basically protecting those thugs often. Um, so the defenders of the good people, Kaczynski himself quite clearly, present themselves as redemptors. They are going to take people from sin, error, and evil. They use that language. They use this language symbolically, we also think. Finally, and this is something we didn't talk about much, I um, uh, didn't have time, but we strongly believe, and there is enough evidence, that cultural symbolic polarization that contributes to the generation of sharp social cleavages is detrimental to democracy. Thank you so much. <laughs>